Naturalism is correct? Yes, that you cannot prove that there is no reality beyond the ah, material there's world. There's two separate questions here that have to be distinguished and carefully answered. I'll do it exceedingly briefing. Um, uh, nature exists. Um, if there's an argument against that, uh, I haven't heard it. To argue that naturalism, therefore, is correct simply uh, requires the additional view that none of the positive arguments for supernaturalism work. To declare that supernaturalism cannot be proven false is in itself not a positive argument for supernaturalism. I now, made that Dr. Point Shook, uh, from those two premises that nature exists and that there is no bridge to an, a supernatural reality, do you really think that it follows that nature is all there is? Uh, that is the most reasonable conclusion well, remaining so far. By what so logical far. rule of inference does that follow? It seems to me that from those two premises, all that follows is we don't know if there is something beyond nature. Hmm. Let me try an analogy. Suppose, uh, to, to see how my reasoning process works, let me try an analogy. Suppose you have a large sum of money you wish to invest, and I'm a broker, and I'm telling you the stock market's going up and up and up and up and up, and you say to me, well, now look, I'm pretty happy with my bank uh, checking account. My money's really safe. Uh, give me several positive good reasons for investing it in the stock market. And I proceed to give you one after another really weak in your judgment argument. And after you get past the third or fourth one, you stop me and you say, no, I'm not going to additionally try to put my money in the stock market. I don't want my money there. You haven't given me enough good reasons. Okay, no, so the naturalist is somebody who no, wait, wait, retains... Look, this exactly illustrates my point. That person has not given you reasons to believe the stock market is going up. But that doesn't allow you any way logically to conclude that therefore the stock market isn't going to go up or that it's going to go down. You, you simply have to withhold right. judgment. You see, I, it seems to me your, uh, your, your reasoning here is, is logically invalid. Uh, no, it's not logically invalid. It's simply conservative. I'm very conservative with my money. Uh, well, well let's, let's talk. Uh, let, let me again try to explain very briefly without taking up your valuable time. Uh, look, uh, suppose your stockbroker said, well, why are you so hesitant to invest money in the stock market? After all, you can't prove that the stock market won't go up. Should you say, well, come a day, I'm getting rich. I can't prove <laughs> the stock market Doc, isn't going up. I'm going to get rich. Come on, now, look, Dr. Shook. That's, uh, Dr. Shook, that's unwise let, Dr. Shook, please, let, look, let's be serious. The point is, <laughs> the, the, the point is, I, the I assure from, you, I'm serious from about the money. lack of evidence that the market will go up, it does not follow that therefore the market will not go up. I just but it doesn't to that, follow yes. that it's going to go down. You, you, I, I agree with that And yet naturalism entirely. is the view that there is nothing beyond the physical world on your definition. And you admit you cannot prove that by reason, no, science, no, and experience. You're, you're manipulating words. A naturalist is convinced that nature exists. Okay? So am I. You're asking the naturalist to additionally believe in the existence of the supernatural, and the naturalist is simply saying, give me some good enough positive arguments. That's not now, the definition of naturalism you the... give. Your, na your definition of naturalism is that there's nothing beyond the physical world, that there's nothing in addition to matter and energy, there are no supernatural realities. And the absence of evidence for those leaves you at best with agnosticism, not with naturalism. Naturalism oh. cannot establish its oh, own worldview. You. Quite right. It's unfortunate that we're back to debating terminology instead of reality. Uh, look, um, it, this business of agnosticism is a bit odd. Suppose I were to say the reason why I uh, don't believe in the supernatural is because, uh, you know, I have not enough good reasons to believe in it. Now, does this make me an agnostic or an atheist? In a weird sort of way, I'm both. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive terms. An agnostic is somebody who cannot prove that supernaturalism is false. But again, that in and of itself is not a positive reason to go ahead and jump into the But has anybody offered in tonight's something? debate the claim that because you can't show supernaturalism to be false, therefore you should believe in supernaturalism? Who has argued that tonight? Well... <laughs> Nobody. Uh, 
I've, I've given five when, positive when arguments you, for supernaturalism, tonight, and we've not heard uh, any positive arguments for naturalism. All you have said is that my arguments fail, but that doesn't serve to establish that, that the material world is the only reality there is. There could be something beyond it. There could be something beyond it, and I've already all told right. you it might be more nature. <laughs> for all you know that, or anybody that's knows, I don't need if the it, supernatural. If it's more nature, it's not beyond it, right? That's a self-contradiction, uh, friends. Those who say that there may be more nature beyond it, it's still nature. That's, that doesn't, uh, doesn't say there is something beyond nature. Hi. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the burden of proof, and I just wanted to point out, firstly, that you cannot prove the non-existence of a thing. And naturalists accept this. But the problem is, uh, when you invoke God as an explanation for that, what you're doing is you're invoking something that is inherently inexplicable. Thereby, you're not solving the problem. You're not explaining anything. You're confounding the problem. You have more to explain. And I just want to ask you, do you think that invoking God as a hypothesis about uh, natural things or the origin of life or the origin of the universe, I think that's an advancement to knowledge? Um. Now, repeat the first part of the question again, because I, I disagreed with what you said there. It is impossible to oh, prove yeah, right. the non It's impossible to prove something does not exist. That's, that's silly. Of course you can prove something does not exist. Uh, we can prove, for example, that there are no living Tyrannosaurus Rex on the face of the earth. We can prove that there are no Muslims of the United States Senate. Uh, or, as Dr. Shook says, if you can show that something is a self-contradiction, uh, he's in the house. Yeah. Uh, um, you can show that something is self-contradictory. So there are no married bachelors. So it's, it, this is an atheist line that you hear on a popular level all the time, but that sophisticated atheists don't take because it is easy to prove that things don't exist. Now, now the question is, if it is the case that you can't prove that God does not exist, then you shouldn't be a naturalist. You should be some sort of agnostic or something, but you shouldn't say th go around saying things like, nature is all there is. There is nothing beyond matter and energy. There is no supernatural reality. Because those claims exceed what you yourself say you can prove. So you need to make more modest claims about your position that are, are more simply agnostic or something and find a new name rather than naturalism because that's, that isn't something that you can sustain the burden of proof for. Now the last part of your question assumed that I was presenting God as some sort of an explanatory hypothesis. And if you look at my arguments, they're not like that. These are deductive arguments. Now what that means is that if the premises are true, that the conclusion follows logically and necessarily. Whether you like it or not, whether you think it's explanatory or not, it doesn't matter. All that matters is, are the premises more plausibly true than not? Because if they are, then the conclusion is logically unavoidable. And so, yes, I think they definitely represent an increase in knowledge. This is an example of deductive logical reasoning. And it, it can't be impugned by saying that it's not uh, some sort of uh, explanatory inference to the best explanation or something of that sort. Dr. Craig, this question is for you. All right. Why does the lack of ultimate significance entail the lack of temporary significance? It seems to me that um, in order for something to be significant, to be important, it needs to make a difference. That's what it means to be significant. And so if no matter what you do, everything winds up the same, your choices are ultimately insignificant. That is to say, they're inconsequential. And on naturalism, all of our choices, the entire human race, is ultimately inconsequential. It, it doesn't matter. It's insignificant. And that seems to me to be virtually undeniable on, on atheism. Um, may, I, may I deny it? Excuse me? May I deny it? Sure. Um, you know, it, 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 you, somehow it's this temporality that seems to really matter to you. Um, you know, that unless it is 
you say, you're right, it's, it's almost a tautology. In, in order for something to be significant, it has to make a difference. Uh, but, but why can't it just make a difference uh, for some duration and not forever? If somebody is in pain, yeah. is suffering, and I can do something to take that suffering away, that matters. And it doesn't matter that neither I nor the sufferer will exist, you know, Well, let's forever. remember that my argument is a tripartite argument. And yeah. there are three components to it, purpose, value, and significance. Now, I agree that if things have objective moral worth and value, then their being merely temporary does not mean that they're insignificant. That in that case, you can have significance despite its transitoriness in virtue of its moral worth. But my argument is that in the absence of God, there isn't any objective foundation for the affirmation of objective moral values and duties. These are simply illusions fobbed off on us by the socio-biological evolutionary process. And therefore, um, you can't rescue significance by appealing to the inherent moral worth of temporary yeah. things. If it were only um, the biological process, the evolutionary process, um, how could it be uh, that through reflection, slowly, far too slowly, we actually can make progress, right? Everything. So, so every, you know, so uh, there's nothing more biologically determined than um, uh, male dominance over women. Uh, nothing is more, right? This is. Uh, well, now wait, Rebecca. <laughs> by, by what? By and what yet, you wait, underestimate yeah. women? <laughs> <laughs> we have we have our ways but but um but you know and but we are slowly you know this is or there, there's all sorts of behavior that is biologically determined right xenophobia uh i spent a lot of time in africa observing the chimps it was uh, one of the most amazing experiences for me i mean i came back and all I could only see, uh, I, I came back to a conference, um, actually, uh, and there were two men on either side of me. Uh, so, <laughs> this is my fate, this is my doom. Um, and um, they were uh, arguing over me, and there was a little lady in between, and you know, and they were pointing their fingers and blah, 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 and trying also to impress me a little bit. And, um, and, you know, I, all I could see was what I had just seen um, in Uganda, right? These, these men. You mean among, you know, among the bonobos and the chimps? Um, not bonobos. Oh, bonobos are entirely different. Bonobos are, are Fair female. Fair enough, but yeah, the point yeah. is among that the, the, chimps, same, yes. the same sort of social behavior exhibited by Homo sapiens is already present in their primate relatives like yes. baboons and chimpanzees. Yes. And there is no reason to invest human morality with any more objective significance than that kind of behavior that evolution has pr programmed into other primate species because it's advantageous in the struggle but for that's survival. Not it's how just we a herd morality. Progress. That is not how we pre progress. That's what, not what? Moral, what, what civilization is, what moral progress is. Wait, is wait, battling, where, where do you get the word battling, progress? Oh, yes, on I get the progress. A naturalistic worldview. I think on a naturalistic worldview, you would be justified in talking about moral change, but the word progress smuggles in yeah. yeah. a standard. Yeah. Yeah. If but that's because you think, that's because you think on a naturalist uh, basis, on a purely naturalist basis, uh, there is no way to justify, to ground objective morality. That's what you, True. I mean, right. C could so I? So since I don't buy that premise, uh, I do think that one can talk about moral progress. Could I read you a quotation, and I want you to comment on it. Sure. 
Okay, and here's the look, Before you do that, we are running out of time as All much right. as I hate to say it. So please do that. Please do that. And then I'm going to okay. ask you to each make a last statement. The scientific outlook has taught us that some parts of our subjective experience are products of our biological makeup and have no objective counterpart in the world. The tastiness of fruit and the foulness of carrion, the scariness of heights and the prettiness of flowers are features of our common nervous system. And if our species had evolved in a different ecosystem or if we were missing a few genes, our reactions could go the other way. Now, if the distinction between right and wrong is also a product of brain wiring, why should we believe it any more real? And if it is just a collective hallucination, how could we argue that evils like genocide and slavery are wrong for everyone rather than just distasteful to us? That's a statement by Steven Pinker. <laughs> Well, <laughs> but the cause hasn't got to be God. Well, remember, I gave a, uh, an argument for thinking that this cause is timeless, yes, spaceless, immaterial, uh, enormously powerful, and personal. I think it's a computer. Well, that wouldn't. Uh, computers are designed by people. I no, mean, no, this is a self-designing computer. Uh -huh. Timeless. Timeless. Well, that's a contradiction in terms. Why is it time? What's well, contradictory about it? A, a computer has to function. It takes. Oh time. no! This is a special computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it has to be logically coherent. Oh, it's logically coherent. Yes, you have to be logically. Oh no! Coherent. This and, computer and besides, is amazing. No. It, it, besides, it, it would have to be, as I said, a personal being. No. In, a computer is a physical Not this computer. Object. Oh, well, then, no. Okay. See, what you're doing is you're actually, what you're calling a computer is really God. A, a, a non-physical, <laughs> non... Together with a reason why people believe, desperate to believe, together with the fact that you don't need actually a God, in a sense, amounts to an argument against the existence of God. Well, I, I guess I don't see that. I mean, why doesn't that commit the genetic fallacy of trying to say that by explaining how a belief originates, you thereby show the belief to be false? Even if it were true that belief in the existence of God were the product of fear and anxiety and so forth, which I don't for a minute admit, but even if it were, it, that's simply a genetic fallacy to say that because that's the way the belief originates, but that's only one that therefore the belief is false. But that's only one half of the argument. I'm not saying that that alone is adequate, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that the fact that science can account for everything it alone is also adequate, but taken together, the fact that, one, that science is omnipotent and the fact that I can understand why people like you desperately want to believe in God. That is an argument against it. No, but two fallacious arguments put together don't, don't make a sound not, argument, right? Are, but, <laughs> but, 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 but do you deny that science cannot account for everything? Yes, I do deny that science So what can't it account for? Well, I, had you brought that up in the debate, I had a number of examples that I was going to give. Uh, I think there are a good number of things that cannot be scientifically proven, but that we're all rational to accept. Let, so, me list, let me list five. Logical and mathematical truths cannot be proven by science. Science presupposes logic and math, so that to try to prove them by science would be arguing in a circle. Uh, metaphysical truths, like there are other minds other than my own, or that the external world is real, or that the past was not created five minutes ago with an appearance of age are rational beliefs that cannot be scientifically proven. Ethical beliefs about statements of value uh, are not accessible by the scientific method. You can't show by science whether the Nazi scientists in the camps did anything evil as opposed to the scientists in Western democracies. Aesthetic judgments, number four, cannot be accessed by the scientific method because the beautiful, like the good, cannot be scientifically proven. And finally, most remarkably, would be science itself. Science cannot be justified by the scientific method. Science is permeated with um, unprovable assumptions. For example, in the special theory of relativity, the whole theory hinges on the assumption that 
the speed of light is constant in a one-way direction between any two points A and B. But that strictly cannot be proven. We simply have to assume that in order to hold to the theory. But you're missing the whole... So, you got in your pipe and smoke. Yeah, you? okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, okay. We are, uh, none of these beliefs can be scientifically proven, and yet they are accepted by all of us. And we're Ethical beliefs about statements of value uh, are not accessible by the scientific method. You can't show by science whether the Nazi scientists in the camps did anything evil as opposed to the scientists in Western democracies. Notice that he admits that without God there are no objective moral values. He writes in one of his works, science shows us that there can be no moral distinction between an administered poison and one that the body itself is slowly generated. Do you understand what he's saying? There's no moral distinction between poisoning someone deliberately and that person dying of natural causes. Now, I hope that Dr. Atkins and his wife are happily married, because if she believes that, uh, then if I were he, I'd start eating in restaurants. Uh, I think that on a serious note, it's evident that there is a moral distinction between deliberate murder and just dying a natural death. I don't remember writing that. Yeah. I, I uh, have, did, did he have it in my did, he, did Dr. Craig misrepresent you when he said that uh, you're in your treatment of poison, you don't distinguish uh, uh, the administration of poison from simply the event of the end of life. I honestly don't remember write, um, writing this, but if you say I wrote it, yeah, I have it in maybe I was case. hallucinating at the time when I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, I'm, uh, I think the point was that whether a person dies because someone's administered poison to him or because the body just forms its own poison because it's ill and dies, yeah. that you said there's no moral distinction. But that is clearly transgressing well, the bounds of science. Science nonsense. could prove that there... But those are your well, words. Well, it's so you say, but I think they're nonsense now. Oh, well, all I, right. I, 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 I do, too. I mean, if, 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 if it's what I wrote, then I think it's nonsense. All right. They're all obviously right. taken out of context. Uh, uh, have we concluded that one? I guess. <laughs>
scientists in the camps did anything evil as opposed to the scientists in Western democracies. Aesthetic judgments, number four, cannot be accessed by the scientific method because the beautiful, like the good, cannot be scientifically proven. And finally, most remarkably, would be science itself. Science cannot be justified by the scientific method. Science is permeated with um, unprovable assumptions. For example, in the special theory of relativity, the whole theory hinges on the assumption that the speed of light is constant in a one-way direction between any two points A and B. But that strictly cannot be proven. We simply have to assume that in order to hold to the theory. But you're missing the whole so put you, that in your pipe and smoke it. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. We are, uh, none of these beliefs can be scientifically proven, and yet they are accepted by all of us, and we're right. Now, Dr. Harris says, but we can imagine creatures being in the worst possible misery, and it's obviously better for creatures to be flourishing. The well-being of conscious creatures is good. Well, of course it is. That's not the question. We agree that all things being equal, flourishing of conscious creatures is good. The question is rather, if atheism were true, what would make the flourishing of conscious creatures objectively good? Conscious creatures might like to flourish, but there's no reason on atheism to think that it would really be objectively good. Now here, Dr. Harris, I think, is guilty of misusing uh, terms like good and, and bad, right and wrong, in equivocal ways. He will often use them in non-moral senses. For example, he'll say there are objectively good and bad moves in chess. Now that's clearly not a moral use of the terms good and bad. You just mean they're not apt to win or produce a winning strategy. It's not evil what you've done. And similarly, in ordinary English, we use the words good and mad, bad in a number of non-moral ways. For example, we say Notre Dame has a good team. Now, we can hope it's an ethical team, but that's not what's indicated by the win-loss record. That, that is a different meaning of good. Or we say that's a good way to get yourself killed. Or that's a good game plan. Or the sunshine felt good. Or that's a good route to East Lansing. Uh, or there's no good reason to do that. Or she's in good health. All of these are non-moral uses of the word good. And Dr. Harris's contrast of the good life and the bad life is not an ethical contrast between a morally good life and an evil life. It's a contrast between a pleasurable life and a miserable life. And there's no reason to identify pleasure misery with good and evil, especially on atheism. So there's just no reason that's been given on atheism for thinking the flourishing of conscious creatures is objectively good. But Dr. Harris has to defend an even more radical claim than that. Uh, he claims that the property of being good is identical with the property of creaturely flourishing. And he's not offered any defense of this radical identity claim. In fact, I think we have a knockdown argument against it. Now, bear with me here. This is a little technical. On the next to last page of his book, Dr. Harris makes the telling admission that if uh, people like rapists, liars, and thieves could be just as happy as good people, then his moral landscape would no longer be a moral landscape. Rather, it would just be a continuum of well-being whose peaks are occupied by good and bad people or evil people alike. Now, what's interesting about this is that earlier in the book, Dr. Harris explained that about three million Americans are psychopathic. That is to say, they don't care about the mental states of others. They enjoy inflicting uh, pain on other people. But that implies that there's a possible world, which we can conceive, in which the continuum of human well-being is not a moral landscape. The peaks of well-being could be occupied by evil people. But that entails that in the actual world, the continuum of well-being and the moral landscape are not identical either. For identity is a necessary relation. There is no possible world in which some entity A is not identical to A. So if there's any possible world in which A is not identical to B, then it follows that A is not in fact identical to B. Now since it's possible 
that human well-being and moral goodness are not identical, it follows necessarily that human well-being and goodness are not the same as Dr. Harris has asserted in his book. Now, it's not often in philosophy that you get a knockdown argument against a position, but I think we've got one here uh, by granting that it's possible that the continuum of well-being is not identical to the moral landscape, Dr. Harris's view becomes logically incoherent. And all of this goes to underline my fundamental point that on atheism, there's just no reason to identify the well-being of conscious creatures with moral goodness. Atheism cannot explain the reality, the objective reality, of moral values.